Let's give them a hand as they come on up. I'll have them introduce themselves. Go ahead. My name is Ron Judkins, um, <laughs> writer director of Finding Neighbors. Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Young, one of the producers of Finding Neighbors. So we always like to start by, um, you, if there's anyone in the audience from the cast and crew you want to recognize? No. No. <laughs> no, Ryan Alosio's here. I forgot. Give him a hand. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, Ryan uh, was, was the lead in my previous film, The High Line, that we shot in 1999. And he's back in Finding Neighbors. It was so great to... Right. So that's part of the story, but we don't want to get off the format here. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. So we always like to start is anyone, with... Is there anyone else here from the cast or crew? That they're missing? I'm sure. No. Okay. Um, we always like to start with story and script. How, so how did that come about? Story, what was the ideas, and then kind of how did it get down on paper? Well, the movie that Ryan starred in was called The High Line. We shot it in Montana in 1999. It went to Sundance, and we sold it to Showtime, and it had a pretty good life. And I thought that would sort of catapult me into doing studio fare or things that other people would pay for, actually. And got an agent, did all the things you're supposed to do, went into development on a project, that fell through, another project, that fell through, and like 10 years went by, 11 years. And so, and I, I'd made my first film, I, I wasn't, I was in my 40s when I made my first film, so I thought, well, if I'm gonna make another film, I need to do it kind of the way we did the High Line and just sort of gather up the resources that we had. And I started writing, I'd written two scripts in one year, um, and the first one was more of a road movie, and I thought, I don't know if I can do that cheap. I can do it kind of cheap, but not cheap. Uh, but then I thought, well, what can I write that we can do in Los Angeles and you know, use people's houses and those kinds of things? And I started writing a story about a, I didn't realize that the, when I started that I was kind of writing about myself, but um, I wanted to be someone in the creative arts. Um, I, I don't love movies about the movie business so much. They often, to me, feel narcissistic and a little strange. And I'd seen the the story about the the, the novelist who has the writing writer's block, so um, I thought it would be very interesting to have him be a graphic novelist, and that would bring a, a whole visual element to the film, and also a way to get into this guy's head, who's basically kind of a passive character. Um, but wanted to write a story about someone, you know, in midlife who had kind of lost their passion, and. Um, you know, felt like life was passing him by and the culture is obsessed about youth and what do you do in that situation? So that was the beginning of it for me. And then how did you, um, how did Jennifer get on board as the producer? Um, well, I actually came from the production world. I came, I, my normal day job is as a costumer. I work as a film costumer, costume supervisor. And um, Ron asked our very good friend and neighbor Judy if she would produce this film and and I knew and and we all knew also that I was going to be we're married by the way that's and, what I was um, implying right there good. <laughs> um, and and we all knew that I was going to be part of it but I wasn't sure what I was going to do I just knew that I didn't want to do costumes I wanted to do something I had never done before like I wanted to sort of reinvent myself and I started working with Judy um, just kind of picking up you know what she couldn't handle, and we ended up being becoming like a really a really equal, very good team. We worked really well together, so I, I sort of learned as I went. And then, um, what made you decide to do that? What inspired you to produce? Was it something that's just out of necessity, or just like I want to be able to wear this hat and explore it? What what made you kind of take that leap? Um, that's a really good question. I think it was it was more out of necessity and, and also in resistance to doing costumes. I was like, I know I don't want to do that. Done it for 20 years. And um, so, but it was really out of necessity, like I was filling a need. And then Ron, um, can you share your background um, of the other things you do within the industry to kind of give context to that, that, um, my next question? I, um, my day job, as I described, is I do production sound for movies. I've done 13 movies with Spielberg. Um, I worked on Chef, that's uh, just out now. Uh, there's a movie coming out later this year called McFarland that Nikki Caro directed that I was the sound mixer on. But that's my background. So then you're on set watching these directors do their thing, and what are you observing from them that then you feel like you can use to be a director? 
how do you, how would you describe um, what you learned to be able? You know, I thought about the question because you sent the questions a couple of days ago, um, and one of the things I learned, you know, it's like I'm not going to say that I picked up tricks from Spielberg, you know, but but one thing I did learn in working with a lot of different directors is that every director has their own style, and there are directors that come out on the set and they they manage every shot and they're working on every performance, you know, and there are other directors who just sort of sit back. They cast the movie, they let the cast come to the set, and they let the cast make the movie, you know? And sometimes you think nothing's going on, you know? But you go see the movie, you go, wow, there was a lot going on. So it really, in, in being witness to all these different styles, kind of gave me permission to do whatever I wanted to do, you know, that there's no set way. And I think directing a lot of it's just intuition, anyway. How, how then would you describe your style as a director? What, would you, what words would you put around that? Um, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question, but... We'll have Jennifer ask it. We'll answer it afterwards. <laughs> you want to answer it now? No, you answer it first. I want to hear what um, you have to say. I like to really create a collaborative uh, feeling on the set. I know Ryan can speak to that, where you know, I think the, the worst thing a director can do is to already have the movie made in their head when they get to the set. Um, you want to establish that collaborative relationship. You never know where the good ideas are going to come from. And if you clamp down too hard, they're not going to come from anyone, anywhere because no one wants to speak up. Um, so but there's always a sort of a fine line, especially when you're shooting a film with a really tight budget and tight schedule, where you want to encourage creativity. You want to have some time for exploration, but you can't let that exploration just sort of take over. you know. And um, so it's always um, a, a process, really. Want to add anything to that, Jennifer? Um, I, I mean, I, I think that Ron really was good about that with not just the actors, but also the entire crew, you know, and that was one of our ideas going into it, that we wanted it to be a collaboration and we didn't want it to be this set thing that this is the way that it's going to be. We wanted everybody to sort of be able to bring their magic to it. Um, we were talking backstage and you guys were talking like you had a um, story around funding and Kickstarter. Can you share a little bit about that process for you guys and how, how you guys went about that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, the funding, the funding was, most of it came out of our own pockets, and we had, we did have a few investors, but then we ended up running a Kickstarter campaign, um, once we got into post-production, because we had absolutely no money left, and, um, we, we ran a really successful Kickstarter campaign, and we blew past our goal, and, um, you know, the reason for that was that we added a lot of value to people. And we really, we really, you, when you run a Kickstarter campaign, you can't just like put it up there and go and wait for the money to come in. We really, we had videos, Ron was making videos about how we did the animation and he made a video about all the women that worked on the film. And so we kept adding all of these videos to, to our Kickstarter site and um, it, you know, it, it was just, it, it was a full-time job for both of us. We actually ran our Kickstarter campaign from Montana. We're restoring a 100-year-old farmhouse there, and we have virtually no internet. We run our internet through our cell phones there. And so there were days where there would be a blizzard, and we'd be, like, driving eight miles down a dirt road to the cafe and sitting out in front of the cafe with our hats on, like, jacking their internet in our car, <laughs> running our Kickstarter campaign. So... And how long was the campaign for? It was six weeks, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was six weeks. I mean, that was a tenet of our, what we wanted to create with, with Kickstarter. Because we, we were kind of lucky because we'd, we'd shot the, the movie before we had the Kickstarter campaign. So we had material. We had content to provide to people. And, and so we, uh, we would sort of reach out and engage, you know, like the filmmaker community with how we did the animation. There's a, a short video I did about, it's called Pre Preview of a Scene. There's, it's a scene in the movie. And I explained how it came from my life. So we were like reaching out to the, to the writers. And, um, and it was very interesting to see how people would respond to those videos. And like more people would come on and your numbers would go up. And it's, it, Kickstarter for us was also kind of a proof of concept. Um, and so for us to start explaining some of the themes of the movie, seeing pe if people relate to them, you know, some more than others, you've really find your niche audience or your, your your audience, um, and I, you know, I have friends that run Kickstarter campaigns. If your if your Kickstarter campaign is really a flop, you need to really think about what is you're trying to do because 
you're not engaging people on some level or any level. Um, can you talk a little bit, since you, this was not your first film that you directed, you had um, some experience working with other actors. Did you write for certain actors in mind? Was it the kind of thing where you're just going to write and see how the casting process unfolded? Yeah, I don't write with, like, you know, my star in mind, you know, like Tom Cruise, you know, I'm writing for him, you know, or I just try to create as fully rounded a character as I can and then see who comes along to fill the shoes. Great. Then how um, can you... Talk about how Susan Shotmaker, who's the casting director, kind of got into the production. Is it someone you knew or some a friend of a friend? Yeah, um, Susan had been involved. I'd been involved with Susan on another project, one of the ones that we were in development on. And we'd had lunch a couple times and kind of hit it off. And um, so when we had the script, I sent it to her because, you know, she has a reputation. She was a casting director on um, Short Bus and Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And so she's really drawn to unusual material and, and is very good intuitively in casting. So I sent her this, and she said, yeah, I want to do it. And, you know, we didn't really talk about money. It wasn't about the money. You know, that's the, the beauty of it. I mean, we paid her a little bit, but it wasn't much. She flew out from New York, and we had, like, four days of, of people coming in and reading, and it was great. She she brought in her she brought in readers for the casting sessions and she was really terrific. Um, what advice do you have for actors um, as you saw those auditions? What stood out for you? What 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 made you interested in an actor to call him back? What kind of stood out in that process for you? I love the casting process. Um, to me, you just it's a playground and you're in there and you're just playing. You're not making a movie. You're just you're you're seeing if you get along well with people. You're seeing what kind of natural talent they're bringing to the table. Uh, but there's always a thing that I'll do is, you know, uh, and both times, you know, the casting sessions go really long because I'm having so much fun, I don't want to stop. Uh, so they'll come and go, we need to move on. But I'll give the actor a choice that's obviously wrong, you know? Um, I mean, I won't, I won't admit that it's obviously wrong. It's it's my, you know, it's the idea of what if you look to it and what if, and, you know, it's just to see if they'll take it and run with it, you know, and and and, um, um, and also, I mean, my other theory in that line is that if they show up with something, you want to encourage that. And um, I think, you know, vice, and I, I think it's really difficult. I think coming in and, and reading for a part is probably the scariest thing you can ever do because you go in and typically you don't even know who the different people are, and there, there's several people sitting behind the table, and you get your 30 seconds, and then you're out of there, and it's just really inhumane. Um, so I, the first thing I try to do <laughs> is, you know, bring the actor in. Hey, where do you live? What part of town? Oh, that's cool. Do you have any problem getting over here today? And you know, just from minute one, just establish a a, a, a real sense of communication with them, so that they feel like, okay, all right, this guy seems okay. All right, let's do it. You know. Great, great. Go ahead. Well, and, and one of our actresses said to, to me just the other night at one of the screenings, she said, you know, it was such, the casting process with, with Ron was so great because he was like right there, like totally connected to me. And she said it, that it really made a huge difference. So I think connect, connection. Connection. Love it. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, we were talking about your sets and how that kind of changed halfway through the process. Can you talk about, um, where you shot, how long you shot for, things like that. Yeah, um, so we, Ron, when he originally wrote the script, had a vision of it being sort of like Hollywood Hills, like beautiful Los Angeles, twink twinkly lights down below. And um, we actually did find a location that, w that, you know, we needed houses that were literally next door to each other. And we actually did find an, a location of some friends of ours that would allow us to do that. But there was no, it was in the Hollywood Hills and there was no parking. And so for us to actually get people up and down would have eaten up like two hours of our day every day. Shuttle. Shuttling. So we um, decided to shoot in our neighborhood, which Ron was actually kind of resistant to, right? The beginning, yeah. yeah. But I mean, and, you know, because he had a vision in his mind of what this was going to look like. But we... You know, we needed to use the resources that we had, and I 
the neighborhood, I feel like the neighborhood really became a part of the film. But we shot, so we shot in um, my producing partner and neighbor, Judy Korn's house, who lived across the street from us and one, is one of our dearest friends. And then, that, so that's the main Sam and Mary house. And then hair, makeup, and wardrobe, and the actor's green room, and the production office was all in our house, all of 1,300 square feet. So there was actually one night we were painting our bedroom because they used that as Jeff and Paul's bedroom. And so we ended up sleeping in a blow-up mattress in the middle of our living room floor with like wardrobe racks all around us. And then at five o'clock in the morning, we've got like, you know, hair, makeup, and wardrobe coming in and opening the door. But we used our resources. And I think that the neighborhood really is kind of a character in the film. Well, it ended up being the best decision we could have made. I mean, that's the, another example of just being open to what shows up. Uh, because, you know, it was a film called Finding Neighbors. We shot it in the neighborhood. And there's so many people, um, the, the neighborhood potluck actually is tonight. Jennifer and Judy, five years ago, started this potluck. Six, yeah. And they thought in Atwater Village, and they thought, well, it might last a few months. It's gone on six years. And we, we say that this is the first movie powered by a potluck. Because <laughs> so many people who worked on the movie or contributed to the film, locations, or people that we've met at the potluck, and again, establish that communication and friendship with. That's great. A couple more questions I always like to hear. Um, what happened during production that maybe you didn't plan for that you had to readjust? For example, like you said, the set um, location was one of it. Was there any other things that happened during production where you're like, okay, we gotta turn left here, or we gotta change on a dime? Is there something like that that comes to your mind? It was perfect all the way through. It wasn't perfect. You know, there's, always, um, there's always things that happen every day. I mean, I mean, there was, we originally scheduled 19 days, and um, Ron always said we were going to shoot 21 days, and we actually ended up shooting 21 days. But he, he wanted to shoot at LAX, and he wanted to steal the scenes at LAX, and Judy and I were like, they wouldn't let no, me. we will all end up in jail. <laughs> so, so um, but actually shooting at LAX, we shot at, we shot at the International Terminal at LAX, and... Um, if, as long as, you know, we had all of our ducks in a row and it wasn't very expensive at all. It was actually quite reasonable. I think they charged us like $200 to shoot there or something like that. But you just had to have all of your ducks in a row. You had to have all the paperwork, the permits, insurance, like everything. Um, but that ended up being, we did end up shooting 21 days and the, the airport was like an additional day, so, of the, of the 21. No, I remember something early on. Remember when we had we um, we had an AD who was involved, and because you know the film is in a way complicated because you're shooting in one location for the whole film, and so the the most efficient way to shoot a film like that is to shoot all the scenes in the living room and shoot all the scenes in the bedroom, and so we had an AD who scheduled the film, and it's like a five days before we we're going to shoot, and we had this meeting, a production meeting, okay, just going through the schedule. And I, I'm thinking, if we shoot 12 scenes in the living room, how, how am I and how the actor is going to maintain continuity just from scene to scene when it's so broken up? And you know, by, also by the end of that meeting, my head was just spinning. I, I didn't know what was going on with it. And I broke down into tears. And I said, there's no way I can shoot the movie like that, you know? And so, we thought, well, what are we going to do? We're going to start shooting in five days. Uh, we ended up getting a new AD who came in and rescheduled it. Well, and actually, we our, our cinematographer Terry. actually came in. She came in, and she scheduled it. Um, and then our, our new AD came in, like, literally the day before we started shooting. Right. Um, but there are times when you just sort of have to cut your losses and make a change yeah. and, and go for it. And that was the best thing we could have done. I mean, I would, I would say to anybody who's making a film, like, you have to follow your gut. If there's something that's not working and you're in pre-production, like, handle it now. Don't wait, because it's only going to get worse. <laughs> Can you, um, is there any context or stories to the final product of the scenes that we saw in the movie that you can go, if you knew we had a, what happened before the scene, scene was shot, any like last minute the rain stopped or anything like that? Well, the, the sex scene, actually, in the film, we did actually shoot a sex scene. And it was a disaster. 
I mean, it was a total disaster. You, I w actually wasn't in the room. I just heard about it. <laughs> but so, yeah, that. So a lot of the, um, the voices you hear from the original sex scene that we shot, but, you know, animation was the best this way to go This is a story we've it. never told in any Q&A because it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's one of the dark secrets, but it was a, a day of utter failure on the set. And I felt that I'd completely failed as a director because the, uh, the two leads, Michael and Catherine, for whatever reasons, they didn't get along all that well. You know, and, and I think Michael was, you know, him was his character and she was her character and they would get there on the day and Catherine would make a suggestion and they would piss Michael off and da da da. <laughs> so now they're supposed to have this sex scene and be like loving. Um, and we didn't, we didn't actually get to shoot the scene. You know, like we shot leading up to it and um, I'm not gonna say which actor just, they didn't refuse to do it, but it just wasn't working, you know? So I thought to myself, how in the hell am I gonna deal with that? And I remember at the end of the day, going to Judy and Jennifer and say, we didn't get that scene. You know, they, they think we didn't get the scene. No, we didn't get the scene at all. <laughs> you know, there's no scene, you know? There's a, like a lead up, and so we, um, you know, it sat like that for a while, and I can't remember how we cut the film, because we started, after we cut the film, I think we just sort of jumped over the sex scene, you know? Um, and we, pre we tested the film with just some focus groups, people we knew, and, you know, small groups, and, you know, there were uh, some other little holes in the narrative, things that weren't quite clear, and what, we'd always thought we wanted to have animation in the film, we didn't really know where the animation would go, and we said, what if we just animate the sex scene, you know? What if we, and then there were other places, you know, and it's like, and it was worked beautifully because it did fill holes in the narrative. And you know, looking back on it, of course we should have had the, the sex scene be animation. What was I thinking to get these two people in the room and you know, they're going to do this sex scene? But um, talk about feeling like a failure. I'll always remember that day. Um, we're going to end on this question. What advice do you have for um, actors or? other people who are looking to produce or direct for their first time, whether it be a feature or even a short film, what, what advice would you give them? Um, I think, you know, hmm, that's a really good question. I would say really be bring in people that it, where you're creating a win-win for everybody. I think that was one of the biggest things that we did on our film was we, you know, we like our costume designer was fresh out of FITM and she wanted to design the film and she was like hungry and she was willing to be and do whatever it took to get the job done. So I think it's like bring people onto your projects where it's a win for them and, and don't abuse them. Like really take care of them, feed them well, you know, do everything you can, stick to a 12 hour day, like be considerate of other human beings. Um, I think we were pretty successful in, in creating that on this film and everybody, literally everybody that worked on it was just really said that it was a great working experience. So I think just being considerate of other people and, and yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I completely agree with you um, in creating that win-win. We were so successful in being able to do that in every case. And there's the whole sort of time equation where, you know, if you have money, you don't need a lot of time. You can, you can just hire the right people. And if you don't have money, I mean, we got a lot of people off, off of Craigslist and, you know, um, just put it out to the universe and just see who would show up. Um, it takes time to sort of call through and find those people once they've shown up and find the right people. But it's totally doable. I mean, there's talent everywhere. You know, you just have to find it. Um, but another way of answering your question, like what advice I would say, is, is it really kind of depends on where you are with your career. If you, you know, if you have a name or something, or you you can kind of come in a, at a higher level. But you know, I, I always sort of, you know, now that I've had an experience of not knowing how not to get films made, um, and for so for me, it's like if I was going to do it again, I'd do it exactly the same way. I'm not going to go try to get a development deal unless, well, I'm not going to do it. Probably I might do it for a few months, see if it has any traction, but. Um, Really, it's about, when you're starting out, writing a script or coming across a script that's just an amazing script, making it with people that you know, 
Make it for no money because you can make a movie for no money now. Find a script that you can make for no money because that's that movie is going to be your calling card. It's not going to make any money, or not not get distribution, but you know that's your that's your thing. That's what you show, um, and that's what gets you started. Let's give him a hand. And say thank you. Thank you.